My name is Leanne Buchanan. I'm the Executive Director of Venture Cafe, and I'm so excited to continue hosting the main stage. Up next, we're going to have an insightful panel on artificial intelligence. How do we unleash new opportunities in this space from across Latin America? Our speakers will be, and I'd have them come to the stage as I announce them, Cesar Cernuda, who is the president of Latin America for Microsoft, Emiliano Carjiman, who is the CEO of Satellogic, and that's moderated by Jose diaz Bellart. Emmy award-winning journalist and anchorman at Telemundo Network. Let's welcome them to the stage. Thank you very much, so kind. Thank Good you. afternoon, how are you? So nice to see you all. Gentlemen, nice to see you both. Please sit down. It's a pleasure to see you all. So interesting, the, the the subject, right? Artificial intelligence unleashing new opportunities across Latin America. We have two people who are ke keenly aware of exactly what those opportunities are and how Latin America could continue to grow as a hub of technology and, and so much more. I, I want to start about, you often speak about the fourth industrial revolution that we're seeing or about to see. What exactly is that? And how do you see that going forward in Latin America? Well, good morning to everybody. It's not me talking only about the fourth industrial revolution. I think there's many people um, talking about the fact that the world is changing. And it changes at a pace and speed that we have never seen before. And it's mainly changing because it's becoming digital. So many people is talking about this digital transformation becoming the fourth industrial revolution. And really, the inflection point is around artificial intelligence. And what is this uh, digital transformation? What is all that about? Basically, if we see how we interact nowadays, how do we access information? How do we share information? It's very different than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We all want to be mobile. Basically, we want to make sure that we can access to the information from whatever type of device, whatever type of technology, we want to have access. Second thing is the cloud. Basically, that information needs to be somewhere. And that's what we talk about cloud. The cost of the cloud are you know, something that we can all afford, and therefore, it's simple to access to that information. And basically, when you have mobility and cloud, you're transforming, and you're becoming way more digital. But there's many experts here about this, for sure. Interesting. And, uh, I mean, you have uh, an interesting uh, story to tell. And especially, you know, when I think, and the great thing for me, I'm speaking from like very civilian perspective on this. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert on, on this, but if I think digital future technology, I think Silicon Valley, not Argentina, uh -huh. which is where you really started, and you have this startup that is now a hundred plus employees, putting satellites already up in space. Uh, how do you become a startup in Argentina and not in Silicon Valley? Sure, that's a great question. So I, I think, the, I, I would start by saying, I'm, you know, we're putting satellites in space. I'm not a satellite guy. I'm, I'm not, you know, I wasn't dreaming of being an astronaut when I was a kid. I, I'm a software guy. I, you know, I build software. I build software all my life. Um, and I think the story for us starts around 2009 when I start to think a little bit about the kind of problems that we should tackle, you know, my generation should tackle. I was a little bit uh, uh, discontent with, with working on, on, you know, serving advertising a little bit better. And I was thinking a lot about what were the real problems that our generation needed to address. And I think when, it, when you think about that, you th I, I started to think about food security and energy generation. And, natural, how, how, and how we're going to do these things you know, for 9 billion people in the next couple of decades, how we're going to produce enough food and distribute food and generate energy and distribute energy so they have a good standard of living in a way that, that's sustainable, that we don't drain resources from future generations. And when I started to realize, which I think is very related to, to the fourth industrial generation in, in, in a revolution, is that um, uh, when you think about these problems, we're, we're, the, the main problem we have is not a resource availability problem. We have enough arable land in the world and we have enough sunlight to, to give everyone what we need, but the problem we have is an optimization problem. 
It's a problem of how do we make decisions about the trade-offs between these areas in a way that, you know, that we come up with the best outcome. And, and when you think about it, it's, we really don't have the models. We're making decisions about these things based on the way we've been doing it historically, and we really don't have the models that allow us to make you know, more informed decisions. So I started to think, how, how do we build these models? How do we, do we put all this data in the center so that we build the models so that we make better decisions? And I started to realize, okay, we need to go out and collect this data. And satellites ended up being the best way for us to collect this data. Uh, but of course, once you collect data on a global scale, then how do you transform this data into insights for people? And by the way, the amount of data is massive, right? Exactly. I mean, a satellite essentially taking pictures 24-7 there's a massive amount and, of information. Exactly, and this is where artificial intelligence really changes the game. Is and you know, cloud and artificial intelligence really change the game. Is you know, imagine a satellite collects data over 150 million square kilometers of the planet. So we're talking about billions and billions of pixels that someone would have to go and look individually to see what changed. Uh, and we're doing this, you know, we're, we're gearing up to do this once per day. Uh, hmm. and, and so when you're looking at this massive amount of information, it's impossible, first of all, it's impossible for a person to do it. You actually need computers to do it. But historically, it would have been also impossible for a small startup to think about doing this because the amount of computing power that you would need, you know, would be completely outside of the reach. Computing so, power and also reception, I mean, just to, to hold that amount of information. Exactly, to hold and to process, right? Because you have to run thousands and thousands of instances of computers on top of this data to come out with insights. And I think this is the point where, you know, cl cloud computing uh, is a technology that's enabling us and others to suddenly be able to roll out all these different instances of computers to process vast amounts of data and come out with very specific insights. I'll say there's two very important things uh, as Emiliano you have been talking about that I want to make sure that we remark. First is going back to the first question on data transformation and the fourth industrial revolution. If we look backwards, thinking about our Argentinian SMB, PYME, right, a startup now, becoming international, having such a big project, it's something that was not trivial. I mean, that was probably something that many people would call unrealistic. Today, it's real. And big part of the reason is because small business can really use technology, the same technology in the large organizations. For many years, what we have seen is access to technology infrastructure, you know, was only available for large organizations, regardless if they were in Europe, US, Latin America, or Southeast Asia. The largest banks, for example, have access to all that technology, right? Because they will have resources. Now, the real boom and breakthrough of startups has become because this fourth industrial revolution, this digital transformation is making available, you know, access to all this information through cloud computing in an affordable way. So that's, that's the first thing that I think is very, very important. The second thing that I will say in this industrial revolution that we are living is, in the past, it was very difficult to access talent. Mm -hmm. And Emiliano and myself have discussed this many times. People, there's very smart people all over the world that not necessarily need to go and move anymore, I don't care, to Silicon Valley or the US or Europe or Israel or, there's many more hubs happening today. Mm -hmm. There's a great hub now, you know, here in Florida, thinking about startups, there's several others in Latin America, in Europe, where talented people can really, you know, follow their dreams in this digital era. So, I mean, you know, where did you find your people that could put up satellites uh, in what in three years essentially you went from from concept to first satellite in three years yeah a little bit less than three years for the first satellite and 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 we're launching uh, we launch eight we're launching 60 next year um, I think we we were born like a you know even when I was just me in this company, we were born a little bit multinational, I would say. You know, I, I went to Argentina to build my R&D team that works on the satellite part because I knew I could get the best engineers in the country to work for me because this project is just so exciting. And I'm Argentinian originally, so I knew how to get to them and I knew how to get them on board. Then when we needed to put a manufacturing facility for our satellites, you know, Uruguay was a lot better of a, a solution for us than Argentina was at the time. Why? 
regulatory things around imports and exports in Argentina, which we could talk for hours about, but <laughs> probably not very important. But then even when we went out to look for very specific talent to, you know, to deploy our systems into the cloud and to, and to run them on scale, we built this team in Tel Aviv. In, in Israel, okay, because we could find the talent that we needed there. And then we started putting together our data analytics team, and we did this in Barcelona. And so suddenly, we're 100 people in the company, but we're operating out of five different countries with offices in five different countries. And I think this is a little bit at the core of you know, the way we think about the businesses. You put things where it makes sense. You recruit people where it makes sense. Um, Silicon Valley is no longer the only place where this can happen. And collaboration, actually, collaboration tools and the same tools that we're using for, you know, for, for, um, uh, for, for delivering data to our customers are the same tools that we use internally Where do you launch to from? be able to do that. Where do you launch them from? We've, we've been launching from Russia and China. Why? Uh, because it's, it's a combination. There's 10 countries in the world that have launch capabilities. The US is one of them. Um, uh, but we always look, you know, we're a private company. We look at the price and availability of launch, and the combination of price and availability has always been better for us in China and Russia. Cesar, he was talking about else. how artificial intelligence is really the revolutionary way that you can gather so much information and distill it, essentially. But what role do you see artificial intelligence? And talk to me a little bit about you know, the Microsoft concept of artificial intelligence. Yeah, everybody's talking today about artificial intelligence, but in reality, this has been a concept for the last 20, 30 years. I would love to actually ask the audience here, how many of you have used artificial intelligence once? Maybe half, half? or less, a little bit less than half. How many of you use it every day? Maybe like a third, less? Now, let me ask the following question. How many of you have done search online? How many ser has searched for something online? Pretty much Come on, everybody's done it. <laughs> or giving a command to your phone, you know, with voice, and then the phone will react. Many of us, right? Well, that's artificial intelligence. So for those of you that didn't raise their hand the first time, now you can say that you're using that and pretty much every day. <laughs> artificial intelligence happens every day and more and more in a very natural way. What is behind this artificial intelligence? Basically, and why everybody's talking to the artificial intelligence is the explosion of data. So in the past, you know, trying to have access to all that data was very difficult. Second, was very costly. So you need cloud computing. You need technology that is affordable where you have access to all that data and information. You know, and basically, the second piece is to build those algorithms. For years, we've been building some of those algorithms. Today, technology is helping us to be smarter and to learn from their own data to build those algorithms. So in the case of Microsoft, basically all our strategy, when you think about our cloud computing, we've been for years talking about intelligent cloud. And the reason I'm talking about intelligent cloud was because we were already embedding artificial intelligence. And that artificial intelligence is not about us accessing your data. It's about you using your data in a way that basically can benefit you in your business for all the companies. And we are trying really to democratize artificial intelligence, not just by bringing it to the large organizations, but for every single company, like Satellite. And you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's one thing most Latin American governments are really good at, it's creating bureaucracy so that everything that could take a day or a month takes years, and sometimes it just never gets done. Is Latin America ready for startups? So uh, the, I think it's not only Latin America. That's what I would say. You know, After operating in many different countries around the world, each country has their own limitations and their own bureaucracies. I think um, what countries need to understand, in a sense, is that countries are competing for companies. You know, companies are figuring out where to localize the things that they do based on the competitive advantages that they get in each different place. The way we thought about, you know, where we're going to put each piece of our company based on, on what we're going to do. And in that sense, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not only in Latin America, but I think this is a trend that, it's, that is going to continue. Countries have to see each other as competing for talent that actually moves very, very fast. Um, I think I, I've seen a lot of change in Latin America in the last few years, particularly in Argentina, where I'm originally from. 
um, that is going definitely in the, in the right direction. Uh, it still takes you, you know, in most of Latin America, it takes you months to start a company and, you know, like do the paperwork. And it might take you years to actually uh, close a company uh, when, you, when, when you happen to fail. It, you know, it happens every <laughs> now and then. Uh, and, <laughs> and those things are painful and, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. But I think what's important today is to understand that technology in particular is really leveling this playing field for every country in the world. So it really doesn't matter where you are. You know, if you're using techniques like rapid manufacturing and computer-aided design like we're doing, and you're using cloud computing to you know, throw a bunch of AI algorithms at your data, uh, it doesn't matter where you are. You can be a 100-people company and be completely vertically integrated and build you know, a, a global infrastructure for data collection uh, uh, from anywhere in the world, pretty much. I was two weeks ago, actually. Um, I don't know if anybody attended or not. There was this America summit in Peru. Yeah. Um, basically, several head of states with their ministers were there. Um, and also, it was the third uh, SEAL summit for the Americas. What I was invited, I was a panelist in, in, in several sessions. One of the sessions that I participated on was talking about transparency in governments. But it's not just a transparency. It's also what you just said. That bureaucratic, you know, um, approach to things. Um, one of the examples that I share was with a hu urban um, home uh, minister in Chile. In the past, for example, the ministry will take 280 days. 280 days to do what? 280 days to give, since I come and ask for permission, right, or fulfill the documents to potentially build a house, right? It will so take almost me, a year. Almost, almost a year. year, yeah. 280 days, I'll get that in the day 280, Finally, the documents say, yeah, you can go ahead and do it. There were two challenges, among many others. One is 280 days. That's a lot of time. Second, lack of transparency. I'll go and say, hey, where's my documents? What are we? Who now need to review this? Going back and forth. So we basically went with the ministry and put everything online on the cloud. We moved from 280 days to 28 days. 28. That's true. So of course, great impact. Second, cost reduction for the government. And third, and probably most important, huge transparency. Everybody will know where my document is, which, you know, who's next to approve what. And one of the things that has happened as well there has been a lot of discussion about corruption and other things, which also, given the transparency, change it. So those are real examples happening. I know, I know there's an e-government track happening in eMERGE as well. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of debate. We're working as we can with uh, most of the governments, really helping them to transform in this digital era to become more and more transparent and part of the things is this. So that's bad for the mordida industry. I have to be very honest with you. It's got to be very tough for all those uh, bureaucrats that uh, love to get their padded money by taking some money to agilizar el proceso from 280 days to 289, but not 300. Um, all companies at one time were startups, but as they become bigger, more successful, more entrenched, and more confident and comfortable in what they do, they have a tough time breaking those silos and becoming refreshed. How do you, if you're an established company with a certain industrial culture, change with the times? That's actually a great question, and that's the one probably that I get the most. Um, as I travel in the region, in Latin America, and I talk to many CEOs or board of directors, um, they all need to change. Basically, they say, look, I've been very successful for the last 100 years, 50 years, 25 years, but what has took me here is not necessarily going to be what is going to take me you know, ahead for the next 25 years, 40 years. How do I transform? First thing that I'll say is change is difficult. So first thing that you need to understand is that many times we say, we need to change. But you want others to change, not you. <laughs> so many times the CEOs ask me, say, hey, what do you think is the biggest challenge that I have? And I say, you. You. <laughs> and they look to me and say, what do you mean? I say, I think you're the biggest challenge for your organization. Until you don't decide to go and change with your leadership team and start changing the culture. Forget technology. First thing that you need to think is change the culture of your organization. How do you do that when, in their own mind, their best practices 
or just stay where they are. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. That's a bigger challenge. Because basically, when you come into a place where you have been in a comfort zone, let me actually use Microsoft as an example. We've been a successful company for many years. But suddenly, we needed to change. We needed to change and go and say, hey, the future of this company is going to be around cloud computing, and it's going to be around artificial intelligence. That requires a huge change. As a matter of fact, Satya Nadella took over as a CEO. He came to the first meeting and said, hey, if tomorrow we disappear from the planet, what are we going to be missed for? We need to be relevant, and we need to change the culture. And I want to have a culture of growth mindset. I want to have people thinking out of the box, people being learners, not knowers. When you become big, you think that you know it all. Right. And that's when you stop learning. So he came changing the culture and then building a clear strategy for the, you know, all of us as a leadership team saying, we need to transform the company to become a leader company in cloud computing on artificial intelligence. I think it was H. Ross Perot many, many years ago who said, secret to his success is I never hired anybody who didn't want my job. <laughs> because if he wants or she wants my job, they're going to work towards that. They're going to grow, but so am I. And important is mission statement. Important is why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. Not just have uh, the teams that are comfortable with what they're doing, but have a vision. And, and I think that you, what makes you in many ways in your, in your company unique is that you're doing things for a very specific reason for the future. Sure. And, and we made hard decisions because of that. And I think this is part of what makes the, uh, the culture of the company. To give you an example, if you look at the existing Earth observation market, um, you know, who is buying satellite imaging today? Uh, it's mostly governments, and 75, 80% is governments. And most of that goes to the military. Right? And we decided very early on that we didn't want the military as customers. Okay, so you could say, OK, you, you made the decision on the first day to cut yourself out of 80% of the market. Right, which sounds where like where the real a, money is. Right, which is where the money is. Right, so it sounds like a pretty stupid decision. Right, but uh, we we think not. We think the place where the use of the data that we can produce is going to grow the most, and where it's going to have a positive impact, is going to be around the problems that we think are the problems we need to solve. So, energy, food, natural resources, climate, and we think that every company in the world and every individual in the world eventually will be using it, uh, data generated by our satellites, processed by Microsoft Cloud, and deliver you know, to their mobile phones, to their uh, um, uh, automated systems to make better decisions about the world. And the military spending on, on Earth observation imagery is going to be a very small footnote of the larger market that we can go after. So you see, you can actually put together purpose with commercial goals and understand that you know there's a larger market for uses of technology that are, you know are, are I, I think you know Emiliano's answer is spot on. In that fixed mindset, he will have come and say, look, I'm building this and this is the market, which is military. But he came and said, actually the addressable market is much bigger. So I'm not gonna focus on this one, I'm gonna go for this other one. The real thing that is happening in this fourth industrial revolution, which is digital transformation for companies, is exactly that. That our business models might be different for the future. Basically, you're going to see organizations in all industries. Think about financial services, banks. In the past, the business model was very simple. Now, I say, look, that business model is not sustainable. My addressable market has changed. I need to enter in a completely different a scenario teaming up with fintechs, building all these different technologies to help my customers and serve it in a different way. And the monetization is going to come differently. Retail, health, all of them are having this. So the way we talk about it in many of the discussions we have with our customers is we understand your numbers until today, what are going to be the opportunities and your addressable market in the future, and how can you build those capabilities? both culturally and with technology, to be capable to address that addressable market. Very quickly, just how big is a satellite that you're launching? How big uh, are they? This size, roughly. That size? The size of the table, yeah. And you have already how many up? We have eight up. And how many do you want to have up? We're launching four more at the end of the year. We're launching 60 up. Six uh, zero? Six zero next year. 
Um, and we expect to have 300 operating by the beginning of next decade. Those 300, and, and you talk about something, I love a, a sentence, you know, a quote of yours. You said, the digital transformation will democratize. That's a great concept. What exactly do you mean by that? Uh, look, I have, you know, that I used to run uh, Asia Pacific before I live in Singapore. So I've been exposed to developed markets, emerging markets, um, and, and I really believe this fourth industrial revolution is a unique opportunity to democratize society. Let me talk about Latin America. Many times I get the questions about, oh, the infrastructure and technology is not yet reachable to all the population in Latin America. There's 25% of the population that cannot connect to the internet, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, yeah, that's true. But the truth of the matter is we have 600 million population, including Brazil, in, or 600 plus in Latin America. 180 million students. The youth of the population is huge. And they have born and are living in a digital, natural way. They're, I always call them digital natives. When you think about how we're using that technology in our region, the gap between those students or youth to the ones in Europe or in other developed markets is getting much shorter. The fact that today we can have startups like Santelo in Argentina or several others in Chile is giving us a complete different angle on what is going to happen in society. Just to give you a number, last year in Latin America, we had 50% of the digital invoices worldwide. 50% of the digital invoices happen in Latin America. We have um, a customer in this case that we team up with, which is the Mexico um, uh, um, Tax Authority. We've been working with them the last years, where basically we have moved all the process, the digital invoice, you know, all the invoice piece, and the taxes to the cloud. They have reduced costs by 25%. They have increased the total amount of collections, and people is much happier because they see the process very transparent you know, on what they do. So the truth of the matter is, I do believe that artificial intelligence and data transformation is going to be a great way to bring small companies, emerging markets, to a same speed or pace or closer to the developed ones that we have seen the last years. And you're really a living example of that. The, the, the concept that a, you know, traditionally information gathered and gleaned from satellites has been under the control of a government mm -hmm. or a multi-government institution sure. to democratize it to the level of one country, one company, mm -hmm. one, I don't know, an agricultural community. That's revolutionary. Yeah, and, and before meeting Cesar, I used to say, you know, the same thing. We, our job is to democratize access to space technology. So our job is to democratize access to the information that we can glean from space. And I think if you look, if you look at the planet, uh, it, it, to me it's absurd that we're in the 21st century and there are, you know, specific things about the planet that we don't know that are measurable numbers. Like, you know, people discuss climate change if it were, uh, you know, an idea on a topic, but it's actually a number. You can measure it. You can measure the energy balance of the earth, right? Um, uh, there's discussions, you know, if you're from Argentina, you know this, every year there's discussions between the government and the producer, the agricultural producers. The government says, you know, they produce 12 million tons of, of uh, corn, and the producers will say, no, it was 8 million tons. And there's like 4 million, ton 4 million tons <laughs> of corn that are like, you know, somewhere. Nobody knows what the, what the grain stocks are in the planet. This is the truth. Nobody know, knows what the grain stocks are. So how do we know how we are prepared to deal with a drought, how we are prepared to deal with disease? And no one, no one, I mean, very few people are doing that. I mean, it, it, other than, let's say, your company. I mean, why has this been 2000, end of 2018 before? <laughs> why is this not? So I think part of it is nobody's found yet until today a business model that makes sense to deploy uh, the infrastructure to measure that data. And I think the reason we can do it today is we, because we can lower the cost of the infrastructure a thousand times, uh, because we can leverage you know, cloud computing, because we can leverage um, commercial off-the-shelf technologies to put in space, and we can leverage uh, commercial electronics, 
uh, and, and, and software, because we can leverage that, we can lower the cost a thousand times. And when you lower the cost a thousand times, suddenly you, you know, your business model starts closing, your, you know, your unit economics close, you can sell things and make a margin. And so it becomes possible for us to scale the constellation of satellites to 300 satellites and scale the computing power to, in the cloud to be able to process the data that comes from the satellites. And those things become possible now, and they weren't possible before because the costs were just too high. Yeah, I mean, the cloud is definitely a game changer. Mm -hmm. Definitely the amount of data. Just think about yeah, all these um, big computer centers uh, that we, many big organizations used to have to process all the data, how many technical people you needed, et cetera, et cetera. That's why in the past, only large organizations will have access to all this technology and will be competitive. Today, small business will be able to do that because they basically will pay per use based on the amount of data. And that will give you a complete new business models. I mean, I think that this example is great because yeah. first, the mission is huge. Mm -hmm. We're talking about really, really changing the planet, feeding people that might have challenges in the future. So it's huge, the mission is huge. Second, you're saying, why others have not done it? because probably have nothing out of the box, and then the business economics will have not helped them. Now, when they do the math, I say, look, I'm using cloud computing, I'm gonna be using these algorithms, I'm gonna use my time and effort to build these algorithms and use the back end of a third party, in this case, Microsoft or whoever. You know, and then we also team up to help them you know, with plans that we have like Microsoft for startups, et cetera, in the go-to-market. Well, this is real. This is happening yeah. real time. Um, here to the yeah, emerge. So. And I, I mean, you really are worth applauding because what you're doing and the vision that you have is something that could really change people's possible life spans in, in the future. I also, and this is just from a non-technical thing, I also worry, I was just in Cape Canaveral a couple of weeks ago for one of the launches and I was speaking to a lot of the people that are putting forward their private enterprise with public enterprise uh, for space. And one of the things is the vision of democratizing access to the internet. Uh, because there are com countries like China that make it a requirement that to have access to the internet, you must have these filters and these companies to make money are willing to sacrifice the freedom and future of tens of millions of billions of people. But the, the democratizing of access to the internet not only is it a good business model, but it's also something that could help humanity almost as much as knowing how agricultural flows can change and where water may be coming from mm -hmm. in the future. And that is something that I think what you do is an example of how it can and should be done. Mm -hmm. And access to the cloud in an economical way is something that I think Microsoft must be applauded for. Thank you all very much for being with us today. I very much appreciate both of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Emiliano, Cesar, Jose, what a great conversation. The future is truly now. I think artificial intelligence is ubiquitous with today's um, business. Let's give them another round Thank of applause. You. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thanks.